Hi, everyone, and welcome to Geeks in the Garden. I'm Karen. Hey, and I'm Kat. Yes, we're back. We're back from our extended summer vacation, unintentional. It's just been that kind of summer, right? Indeed. (laughs) So um, let's just get cracking. Let's just do it. Let's just dig in. So um, it has been just about a year since we started our Yay! podcast. Woo! It's like it's our, our anniversary. <laughs> We're just so excited that we've been able to do this and chat with each other and chat about plants, um, which we obviously are both so passionate about. And in honor of the occasion, we thought we would give out our first annual plant awards. Right. Cue the fanfare. Yes. So we have a list of awards. Uh, we're both going to give an award each for these categories, um, so that we can just honor some of these plants. Honor, and 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 some of them are maybe not so much of an honor. Um, to just see what's been going on in our gardens, and maybe you can see if you agree with us, and maybe you have another one that you have in your garden that you that maybe you'd like to share with us. Yeah, it's um, a so- people's choice award. You can write in your own categories. We are doing this completely arbitrary. Like exactly. Like uh, the book awards and Hollywood movie awards. This is entirely our opinion. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to picture the statue. Naturally, it's like shiny, golden, maybe a flower, you know. It's the golden trowel. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like the one flea bag. Like, I don't know, <laughs> something like that. All right. Right. So our first, um, and you know, maybe most exciting, I don't know, is our garden VIP. This is the award that I just, we didn't see it coming, but this one just knocked it out of the park to use a sports ball analogy. I can't believe I just did that. I don't even know anything about sports ball, (laughs) but this is the one that really outperformed when we didn't see it coming. My choice for this is the humble primrose. Oh, it's so so pretty. Oh my gosh. They're so pretty. They're so delicate. They're gorgeous from afar. They're amazing close up. You look in, you just see all those beautiful, delicate little veins, all the colors. I had some really pretty pink ones I planted last year. And this year they just bloomed forever, for months, long after I thought they would still be around. They were just kept on going, just kept on with this nice, beautiful, large um, plot of really beautiful pink pastel. And right. they're small, but they make a statement in your yeah. bed. Like you can exactly. see them from, the, from when you're driving by. I always see them first in that one bed. So Yep. I got him right by the sidewalk in front of my house. So everyone's walking the primrose path right in front of my house. I also have like an enormous volunteer primrose that's way taller than me. I don't really understand what that is, but it's a volunteer weed primrose that's like yellow and just crazy town banana pants. Um, I don't know what that one's about. That one's in the backyard, but I, I I'm like that one. That one, yeah, the honorable <laughs> mention, cause that one's just crazy. And then that one's fun too. So yeah, primroses, thanks for being around. Well, for me, um, in my garden, my garden VIP is the Rebecca, the black eyed Susans. And the reason is, is the, you can't kill these things. Um, there's a reason they're the state flower of Maryland, because even though I brought these black eyed Susans from Western Pennsylvania to my garden here, uh, they did not truly thrive until Maryland's weather hit them. So um, not only that, it is now that little patch uh, has doubled, tripled, quadrupled. I have given it to multiple neighbors, multiple friends. You have a sum in your garden. Yes, <laughs> it's just like, it's black like for me. In my yeah. yard now. It's like the welcome wagon of my yard. If somebody helps me, I'm like, here, take take some black eyed Susans with you. So as I take a walk down my street, I see which neighbors have some of my black eyed Susan. So that's my garden VIP. <laughs> yeah. Gorgeous. I love them. They are so friendly. I love to look at them and think of you every time. <laughs> so our next category is feistiest plant. I like how you just mm-hmm. put that in there. We're going right to the, the fun fun stuff. So, and I love your, your pick for this one. 
Oh my gosh. Yes. So last year during the pandemic, I decided like so many people, I was going to plant vegetables. Um, you know, I don't have that much experience with vegetables. So I planted carrots and they didn't do so well. They ended up being really meager and they didn't taste great. So I was like, whatever failed experiment. Well, imagine my surprise when this year the carrots came back. Not only did they come back, but they came back with a vengeance. They were everywhere. I guess it's because I let them go to seed. I guess that's why. I don't know. I didn't really expect (laughs) that to happen. I mean, they're definitely not a perennial, so I guess they went to seed. But in any case, not only did they come back, but they grew enormously tall, as tall as me. And they just not, I had all these like sugar snap peas I planted. Oh, no, no. They would not stand for that. They took over that plot. They took over the flower plots. They took over everything. And they, I mean, they have gorgeous flowers. Like, I'll give them that. I mean, they're really pretty. They'll give me that at least, but they've taken over everything else. They don't stand for anything else being in their way. So I will give them credit for their feistiness. Now I did just dig one up. And do you think that there's a luscious carrot underneath? No, of course not. There's still a wimpy little white flavorless icky thing underneath. So I don't know. It's not delicious, but it is feisty. So I'll give it that. (laughs) Well, now your next experiment is to figure out why top part is growing so well and the bottom part is it so yeah, feel free to give give some advice uh, listeners if you have for that so my feisty plant is the bee balm um the reason why is obviously we all love bee balm it is um there's several different kinds we can grow in our garden it's useful for so many different things um and when it died out i was really really sad so i um bought some more bee balm and then I bought some more bee bomb. And then I didn't realize that the bee bomb that I had, that I thought had died, hadn't really died. It spreads. So now I have these bee bombs stuck everywhere and coming out of every crevice because they do spread. It's just, I thought my bee bomb didn't like where it was um, and that it was no longer. <laughs> and everybody's always like, oh, it spreads, it spreads. I'm like, yeah, no, it might never spread. It liked it where it was. Well, it something happened and it spread and It was no longer where I thought it would be. It's somewhere else. Kind of like mint. I guess mint would always be a feisty plant too, but yeah. So our next category... Mm -hmm. Our next category is our wish list plant, the plant we want, the plant we do not have. Yeah. And this is where we're going to need a little sad music. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So uh, sycamores are probably my favorite tree. And I have a tree I planted that I love, 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 loved. And sadly, despite all my best efforts, the cicadas actually did kill my cicada, my sycamore with all of their vigorous egg laying. Um, so um, it's went from my, from being a, solidly on my garden list to back onto my wish list. Um, so that is definitely something I am back on the market for. I'm going to repopulate. I spent some time in mourning. There's definitely some tears shed, but now I'm bouncing back. I'm going to find some more sycamores. I'm going to repopulate my yard with the species for sure. <laughs> well, my wish list plant is one that I've had, but it's one that I can't seem to ever get to grow for me. And I don't think I'm alone in this because there is like the lament of the Duffinium lovers that um, it is a hard plant to grow. Oh, and yeah. Maybe that's why it's always on my wish list. I would just, uh, when I see it in other people's gardens, I'm always like, oh, just envy and, and just want and need. So that's my wish list plan. But I also have given up on trying to grow it. I will enjoy it. And I buy bouquets every time it's at, you know, Trader Joe's or one of the other, um, I will buy bouquets, but I have given up the frustration of trying to grow it from where oh. I Delphinium. Yep. I had <laughs> blue delphinium last year. Hope springs eternal. And boy, did that thing die. It just died. Yeah. It, oh. And dramatically too. Yeah. It's just like, I don't like you. I don't like here. I don't like anything about this. <laughs> so. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, on to a much more uh, satisfying category is our prettiest plant. Mm-hmm. And for me, it this year, I just, 
fallen back in love with poppies. I've always loved them. What's not to love, but I really just fell in love with the variety. Um, I have known some of the basic varieties and they're gorgeous. I mean, what is not to love about poppies? But this year I, I um, tried some different seeds and oh, they're so pretty. I tried um, ones called poppy Thai silk pink champagne. I tried one called Iceland Poppies Pastel. And then the one that just really like wowed me were these ones called Amazing Gray. And that doesn't sound pretty, but it was just these gorgeous, like almost lavender grays and creams and oh, just so, so pretty. So that's my produce flower. Oh my gosh. Yes. Your gray poppies are like, I don't know, a Victorian dress or something <laughs> like very oh, ethereal. <laughs> oh, ethere- like, yes. I don't know. Yeah. Some sort of fairy creature. I don't know. They, they, yeah, they're astounding. Really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. My prettiest plant is the Neptune hybrid tea rose that mm. I got this year. Oh my gosh. I waited and waited for the blooms and oh my goodness, I could just like kneel at it and have religious experience every (laughs) single time. It blooms, just these creamy lavender, purple, blue petals, just each one perfect. So many petals, creamy, luscious. Oh, it's almost wrong how beautiful they are. And then, you know, the smell on top of it, it just as the essence of rose, just really, really rich rose smell. It's like my favorite smell. I love it. Um, so definitely the, the Neptune rose, just, I am in love with it and just, just grateful it's in my life. Just thanks <laughs> Neptune rose for giving me hope again in the beauty. You are my Neptune rose. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> So our next category is I think this is yours to take. <laughs> oh, it is. It is. So it is. I got so wrapped up. I'm like, whoo, Neptune around. So, okay. Um, weird plants. We were talking about weird, 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 bizarre plants, right? Because, you know, we like a good weird thing, I think, definitely. Um, so um, I planted last year in honor of the pandemic. If you can honor a pandemic, I honor a pandemic, but just to remember my, you know, our time, just to like kind of put a, bookend in the whole experience, though it's not over, goodness knows. But um, I, I planted a button bush at any rate last year because the um, the the flower the the flowering the the seeds and all the the balls that come off of it look kind of like the COVID molecule, and I thought that would be kind of interesting just to sort of remember 2020. Well, it finally um, bloomed; they all came out, and boy, does it look bizarre! It is just like super cool. They are spherical; they have all the little spikes all coming off of it. And it is super duper weird and awesome. And they definitely look like molecules. If you don't want to think of them as virus particles, which maybe we don't, um, then you can just think of them as, you know, I know a happy molecule, you know, maybe a happy cell, helpful. Yeah, cell. I, I was going to say, I never would have thought of them that the second you said, doesn't that look like a current? I'm like, oh my God, it does. <laughs> and now All right. and we'll forever be known. Ruin that for you forever. But yes. Um, It's also super fun. A friend of mine really wanted some of the seeds. So I went off and just picked off a bunch and that was super fun. Like the child in me really enjoyed just taking all the spikes off and like just whoosh, you can just swoop them all off and, and, put them into a bag and then you get just this this, like tiny hard little ball underneath which is also just all right you I was gonna say you can save me some too so (laughs) I totally will yes it's just fun to play with in every way um so yes that's my my weird plant also weird is my obsession with seeing this virus in flower form all right (laughs) (laughs) well my weird plant is um weird and useful so it's uh the eyeball plant but when that's what it's commonly known as, but when I got the seeds, it's actually called the toothache plant too. So, um, but it has these little golden yellow flowers with these burgundy eyes on them. And they do look like little eyeballs looking up at you. Um, but what's really cool, it has, um, analgesic agent in the, um, it has a natural one in the leaves and the flowers, and that's what they used to chew and help with toothache. So there you go. I've got my little medicinal part of my 
herb garden going on, but that one's kind of cool looking and weird. Weird and, weird and wonderful. So witchy. I love it. <laughs> so next up, oh, this is not good. This no, is our this is top fauna foe. And both of us really suffered this summer. I mean, gosh, I would say that, you know, it took up a lot of our summer and our energy. So perhaps that's why we weren't podcasting, but um, the one that we talked about during our last podcast kind of really hit our gardens towards the end. And that was what, Karen? <laughs> oh, you know, okay, cicadas. I was there for you. I, <laughs> I you been, were, you were all about the cicadas. Oh my gosh. Oh. I was like a big cheerleader for those cicadas. I took those photos. I macro lens. You're coming out and all of that. And I still, you know, I, I, I still am in favor of their existence and all of that. But, um, and, and honestly, I wonder if my netting the trees didn't almost hurt it because I think I was so overzealous in the netting that I might have damaged the leaves in the process. And I netted maybe not completely. And so they still got in. So then the trees suffered from netting plus, um, you know, plus, uh, you know, having the cicada damage. Well, long and short of it is my trees suffered a lot of cicada damage. And um, the sycamore is the only one I know for sure definitely died, but um, at least a few others maybe halfway died and, and more than that have severe wounds on them. So I think, you know, I had just gone through a big bout of tree planting in the last few years, which is exactly what you're not supposed to do when cicadas are coming. So, you know, I know, I mean, let's look at it in perspective. Humanity has wrought much more damage on the environment. I know, you know, the house I'm sitting in now surely had caused, you know, lots more trees were just, I'm trying to keep it in perspective, but yeah, oh, those cicadas really did um, sort of, uh, it put some damage there that, that I'm still kind of recovering from. Oh yeah, that is definitely, um, I mean, you cannot look around our neighborhoods right now without seeing all of the, uh, dead end of all the different, um, branches that are yeah. from the cicada eggs. So yeah. I kind of wonder what that, yeah. I mean, m- most of them will be fine, most yeah. of them will be pruned, but those young ones. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm worried about my one young tree, but she was too big for me to, um, to net. So we're just going to hope that she's okay. Yeah. So, but my fauna foe this year was something that I have not had to deal with in the past. And yet I know it is a number one pest for other people. Um, somehow the deer have never really hit my yard. It's, um, but something that has changed in this particular herd that's in our neighborhood and whichever way that they used to walk and wherever they used to eat. And now they have included my yard, my front yard as part of their grazing. And um, they really did a number on the cut yeah. garden that I had, you know, just naively planted there in the open without any uh, protectant. So I learned my lesson this year. I, a lot of plants were, you know, just essentially a big salad bar for the deer. And I've learned how, uh, or, you know, I, I am researching better ways for me to have the plants that I want and not um, have all the deer them so I will be learning (laughs) yeah those deer are hard I've had if the deer come through a little bit with mine too but not yours was that was particularly painful especially with how you planned it so far in advance with all your winter sewing that really yeah yeah (laughs) man all right um our next category is our witchiest plant. I know both of us are sort of aspiring botanical witches. Um, and um, my favorite witchy plant right at the moment is my St. John's wort. St. John's wort is a fun one because it makes you happier, right? I yeah. actually used it for that purpose. I have other pharmaceuticals that are more refined for that purpose. <laughs> I do like thinking that I could, if I wanted to go out to the garden and use it. And it has some really awesome yellow flowers. They're super interesting. Like the more you look at them, the more details you notice. So really like cool stamen and all of that. So um, yeah, um, I really like the St. John's wort. Um, so that's my favorite. 
Yeah, mine is, I mean, this just sounds cool, but I won't be using it for it, but I have the rattlesnake master plant, um, which it, you know, it was said to be used for rattlesnake bites, but I've read that it, that was probably erroneously, but it, ha- it can be used for some um, cuts and things. But I think the real, like, you know, I guess VIP of witchy plants is calendula because it can be used for every, everything with the skin, everything, you know, um, my friend made me this gorgeous lotion that I just love. It's calendula. Um, it's got other stuff in there too, but it's just, oh, I put it on every single day. It's, I had a burn. I put some of the calendula on that. It's, you know, it's just kind of an all around great plant to have there. So that's my favorite witchy plant. <laughs> Do you know what the common name of calendula is? Um, well, some people, they call it like, um, I mean, it can, it's a pot marigold, um, oh, okay. but it, it, but it's not the common marigold. Mm. So they go by the same name. So it's, you know, you can buy it in any herb um, and any herb, you know, the seeds are real easy to grow, but it's, it's, it's calendula officinalis is the name of it. So, um, but that's one, it's got these happy little sunny orangish flowers, but it's, you can use the leaf and you can use the flower and um, yeah, you can just make all sorts of stuff. So maybe I'll make up something with the, the last little bit of my calendula. I'll dry it up and I will, um, I'll talk about that, make up something. My friends all make soap. So maybe I'll, um, I'll go make some soap with them. I have some bergamot too. So maybe we'll do something coming up with that. So I'll put yeah, a little... that sounds awesome. <laughs> so, all right. So our next, um, one is our tallest non-tree. Tallest non-tree, non-tree yes. plant. Tree, so tallest- you know, they have time to grow, but you know, our tallest plant that just like started this year and you know, got on up there. Um, I have a Pikes Peak sunflower that I am super excited about. I love to get sunflowers to just go as high as possible. And that was one the deer definitely um got to last year I had sunflowers all over the place this year the deer were eating them just as fast as I could plant yeah them. my sunflower circle was gone yeah like, this one so how, how tall survived. has your um peak it is peak tall, 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 way taller than me I'm gonna say it's probably 10 12 feet high it's yeah it's really what's tall. the tallest you've ever had one because I yeah, I'm... it's definitely the tallest oh it, awesome yeah it has multiple heads which I love it's yeah. got like you know at least three going now and more um more closed buds ready to go and they're like curled they're so big and they're constantly covered with bees that are like so excited about it and neighbors <laughs> are like stopping to notice it so I'm pretty excited about this yeah flower. you have it in the perfect like prime location for, that's right uh, uh, yeah for people to pretty admire it Yes. And people just walk by all the time. So yeah, I'm pretty excited about this flower. (laughs) Well, mine, mine is not, mine is one that should have been the tallest. And that is my hollyhock. I had some of the original and those with, you know, they get to eight to 10 feet, but I guess like by default, my pokeweed that I found in the corner of my yard, that was like a good five, six feet. That's my tallest plant right now. So yeah. An F in the chat for your hollyhock is my daughter <laughs> would say. <laughs> All right. So All right. our next category. Our next category is the um the plant with the most colors. You know, why not? Like, um, and I just had I planted a Joseph's Coke climbing rose last year, and I had begun to despair that it would ever actually grow because it was forever and ever and ever. I thought it was dead. Just saw it actually bloom for the first time yesterday. And it, Joseph's coat from the Bible is lots of different colors, which is why I bought it. Also really love the musical Joseph and the amazing technical dream. Yeah, you know, that's really why you. <laughs> totally a sucker for the cheesiest musicals you can imagine. Anyway, <laughs> that's another topic. Um, it does really have a bunch of colors on it. And I am really psyched about this rose. I hope it climbs, climbs, climbs up the trail. It, it might have to be going on our Instagram then. We need some new photos on it. Oh, Oh, absolutely. Oh, we really do. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. I'll put it on there. Yeah. Okay. And mine is my unicorn zinnias. Um, they, it's just like multiple colors, every color under the sun, 
is in this and it was uh it's definitely a showstopper it's really pretty yeah so our next category uh is a nice way to end it and it is the top lessons that we've learned so for me and this is like sad um but true and i'm sure other people um it got really stinking hot here in maryland really quickly um and i was not out there every morning doing my due diligence. So my top lesson learned is don't take your eyes off the weeds because Mm -hmm. the section of your yard that you let go, it's going to go quickly Um, because we had heat, 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 then rain, rain, rain. Um, And that's all it took. So, and how about you, Karen? What's your top lesson learned? Guess what I learned, Kat? I'm going to blow your mind. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Lay it on me. Plants need water. (laughs) You don't say. Oh, it's true. It's so true. (laughs) Yeah, and they need like so much of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just, we get those deluges and then we have, you know, long spans. Then you have 500 degree days in a row. Right. But it's just like nothing. And that's really hard, particularly on new plants. I really, I try not to plant, you know, a lot of annuals or whatever, but I do have a lot of new perennials and, you know, I love to plant my trees and those need a lot of, you know, deep water. And that is really hard and it's hard to keep on top of. And I've had a couple times lately where I just sort of forgot that this one thing really needed it. And then it kind of got crispy. And then that was the end of that. So, um, so yeah, you just got to keep on top of it because plants can't scream, unfortunately. And <laughs> well, that'd be really alarming if they could. <laughs> no. Well, maybe they are. And it's just at a frequency we can't hear. She's a disturbing thought. I'll live in, I'll, yeah, I was gonna say, I'd rather live in denial. Than... <laughs> yeah. You did just get one of those mimosa plants that you touch it and it withers. And that really disturbs me because I'm like, oh my gosh, is this how they all feel when they're disturbed? This one can just show it like, oh, well, that's all right. (laughs) All righty. Well, this wraps up, I guess, our first annual plant awards. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, next we have uh, a new feature we're going to be doing, and we're going to just kind of talk about a plant. We're going to have a plant of the month, flower of the month, and we're just going to give you some little fun history about it um, because, you know, like there's so many plants and there's just so, so many cool stories about them. So, and that's what podcasting is good. It gives us a chance to story tell. So I'm going to go straight to the end of the alphabet for this hearty little flower of the month, the Xenia. Um, it is, uh, considered an annual where we live, but it can be a perennial, um, any of the Southern states, it's a perennial further North, you're not going to get it to come back every year. So, but what's great about it, it's, it's kind of an old fashioned favorite for many reasons. It is hardy, drought tolerant. It adds these bright pops of color in your summer garden with this dazzling array of color choices. It's really, really easy to grow from seed. I mean, real easy. Uh, And you can happily grow it anywhere. They are not finicky about their soil. They can go in containers. Um, I was at this flea market garden where they had zinnias in like little tin cans and all sorts of things. So they do need about six hours of sun. So, you know, that's not hard to get in the summertime. Uh, And the more you deadhead them, the more flowers you get. So Um, That's a lot of fun. They are nectar rich and they're wonderful for the pollinators. They attract bees during the growing season from May to October. They also attract ladybugs, Japanese beetles, hummingbirds, and wasps. Um, And my favorite thing about zinnias is that while a lot of my other garden flowers are really suffering in this summer heat, my zinnias are continuing to thrive no matter how hot or dry it gets. And that's what makes them such a favorite for me. So let's delve a little deeper into this happy little flower. Now, zinnias are a member of the large, um, very large aster family, and they're closely related to daisies, which is another happy flower. Uh, They're native to Mexico and Central America, where they came into, um, they have all different sizes and blossom shapes. Zinnias were brought to Europe in the 1500s by Spanish explorers, and that version that they took to Europe was a rangy, low, shrubby flower, Uh, and then it was named after 
Johann Gottfried Zinn, who was a German botanist who wrote about the plant. So I think if he wrote about it, he probably named it after himself, but that's, I'm just taking <laughs> that. So in 1796, a Xenia was brought to Europe possibly by way of Brazil when it was presented to uh, Linnaeus, the great Swedish scientist and medical doctor, and it had been labeled Café de Brazil, the Brazilian marigold. And it was this Xenia, uh, Xenia elegans, which the world fell in love with. The Xenia elegans is the ancestral plant from which all of our modern day Xenias have developed. The Xenia produced large, lush flowers in colors which range from crimson to pale lavender. So in 1798, that first Xenia seed was offered for sale to the public in the United States and the Americans weren't interested. The French, however, were becoming interested in the Xenia and by 1856, they had developed the very first truly double form of the flower. And all of the Europe and Great Britain took a liking to the double flower Xenias and by 1864, purple, orange, red, and salmon cover colored Xenias had made their way back to North America and into the gardens of Americans. Our current Xenia varieties come in every shade except blue. They're both single and double flowered forms exist, the latter including beehive, dahlia, and cactus shapes. I have some dahlia ones in my um, yard this year. They're very old fashioned. My, I think my dad's uh, mother and aunt used to grow them. I see all these old pictures of them with these huge, like three foot tall zinnia patches. So now if you want to know more, there's a recommended book called A History of Zinnias by Eric Brazel, where he pieces together a tale involving the Aztecs, Spanish conquistadors, people of faith, people of medicine, explorers, scientists, writers, botanists, painters, and gardeners. The trail leads from the halls of Montezuma to a cliff diving prime minister, from Handel, Mozart, and Rossini to Gilbert and Sullivan. From a little known confession by Benjamin Franklin to a controversy raised by Charles Darwin. From Emily Dickinson, who writes of death and zinnias, to 20 year old woman who writes of reanimated corpses, and from a scissor wielding sex, uh, let's see, I can't say that. <laughs> A scissor wielding old person who painted with bits of paper to the black grandma Moses who painted zinnias and inspired the opera zinnias. So zinnias are far more than just a flower. They represent the constant exploration of humankind's quest for beauty and innovation. And I do have that book on hold at the library. So I'll be delving a little more into it. So that's just it. That's our little feature on zinnias. All right, so for our next feature, this is our making and baking. We are going to be talking about something very special, um, and this is where I get a little bit of revenge for the damage wrought to my precious trees. This is where I consume some cicadas. That's right. Um, in the areas where um, the 17-year cicadas come, it is something of a tradition to eat them. Um, not everyone does it, but those that do are sort of passionate about it. And 17 years ago, I was a coward and did not <laughs> decide, did not actually do it. I had the opportunity. I wanted to, I had it two inches from my mouth and I was like, no, I just cannot. So for the past 17 years, it has haunted me. I mean, I did think about a few other things in between now and then, but still in the back of my mind, I always kind of regretted not actually doing it. Um, and, you know, I am a Marylander and I do love crabs. And let's face it, crabs are, you know, hard shelled bottom feeders. They're not all that different th from cicadas. I feel like this is something I should be able to do. So I decided I was going to seek them out. They were actually harder to find than I thought. So I decided to pursue them on a number of different fronts. One, the savory. Two, the dessert. <laughs> 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 All right. This was a multi-pronged affair. I was going to take this very seriously. So for the first savory um, front here, I packed my poor children into the car and drove them all the way down to Virginia, where I had heard there was a restaurant that was putting them in tacos. Um, couldn't find them locally. That was like, all right, that's okay. We're going to do this. So we drove all the way to Virginia. Thank goodness they did actually have the tacos. They had um, stopped offering them br 
briefly because of an intervention by the health department. But by the time we got there, they were once again serving them. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, they also serve grasshoppers. It's just that kind of a restaurant. So we ordered cicada tacos and um, uh, also grasshopper tacos just to see. Um, I was hoping they would be fried. They were not fried. It was just their whole little bodies in a taco <laughs> tortilla thing with like some vegetables and a little bit of avocado. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So like you, you hold the taco thing and you literally see his little beady eyes staring up at you, <laughs> wondering why, <laughs> why human, why? <laughs> and I'm like, because of my sycamore tree, that's why. <laughs> so I bit down and it does in fact crunch down, you know, and okay you know I mean it does make you feel all right it makes me miss regular tacos quite a bit like boy this experience could be greatly improved if it was literally any other kind of taco but I mean it was okay and then you eat the grasshopper taco and you're like wow I really miss the cicada taco because this is truly truly terrible like they're just bitter terrible so yeah that was a thing that happened so I think fried would have been a lot better. So, um, and also my 15 year old was also brave enough to try it. So it was a bonding thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 There was that. yeah. But like when I eat a soft shelled crab sandwich and like the legs are sticking out of the sandwich, that's always fried, right? I get it fried and that, that you really tasting the batter and all of that. And that's sort of the appeal. So, and you are a vegetarian and I am totally grossing you out. I was right going to say, uh, if anybody can see my face right now. I know. Yeah. She is like turning absolutely green right now. So my apologies to my dear friend. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that was the savory side of things then I decided to also go the sweet route just to like completely cover all of my bases so there was a bakery in Bethesda that was chocolate coating them and then mailing them out now believe it or not there was such demand that they were completely overwhelmed this bakery sent out an email they said that so many people had ordered chocolate covered cicadas they were completely overwhelmed it was more than Christmas and Valentine's Day and Mother's Day they all put together. They could not even possibly deal with the number of orders. I am a little bit scared to think of how they were getting the cicadas. Like where were they going? But that's all right. I'm not thinking about that. So finally, finally, one day um, I came home. There was a box there of, you know, nicely packaged chocolate covered cicadas that were only mostly melted from sitting in the hundred degree Maryland summer weather. Um, opened it up. Picked it up with my daughters, crunched on down, and yeah, sure did go crunch again. Once again, you're left thinking, this is delicious chocolate that would be really, really amazing if it were not for the presence of a cicada inside of it. Yeah, so <laughs> I spent my whole life trying to make sure there's not bugs in my chocolate, so yeah. and yet I know that it's a delicacy, you know, elsewhere. Not cicadas per se, but some... Hearing for the oncoming zombie apocalypse when all we'll have to eat is bug protein. Yeah, you've got it. You've got it going on right now. So yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. very proud of you, my friend. But and um, I have some leftovers in my fridge so that during the zombie apocalypse, you can come over and we can share those chocolate covered cicadas and you and I will live happily for like six hours on that. I think that I will. Um, I will forage in my garden. Okay, and, that's uh, fair. Yeah, and I will. I will eat roots and things that uh. <laughs> if we have some St. John's wort with it, maybe we'll be happy at least. There you go. While yeah. you're eating it. Yes, I, and I'll have my toothache plant that I, you know, can. That's right. It'll, it'll dull the pain. So yeah. the end lesson is just be grateful that you normally eat food that doesn't have cicadas in it. Right. So thank you for joining us today. We are so excited to start another year of podcasting. And um, we just thought we'd wrap up our show as we always do with some sharing some stuff that we're digging right now. Yes, indeed. All right. So um, what I am digging is uh, tree suckers. 
<laughs> I wouldn't normally dig tree suckers. Um, normally, actually, I don't like to see them because they mean, mean a tree is in distress. Um, but in this case, my sycamore tree before it died did put out one sucker and it does have some leaves on it. So it means that the root system is still alive and um, I might still get a, a sycamore tree coming out of there. It's a sign of hope you know, in the midst of all of the desolation of the wreck of my tree. So I'm grateful for tree suckers for that little bit of life persisting despite everything. Um, yeah, I know you're, you're technically supposed to cut tree suckers off when you see them coming. Cause hopefully it'll, you know, um, it, and the energy it, back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I did notice when I, I saw that, that it was pretty much dead when I saw it. So I was like, all right, you know what? I, I don't think there's hope. So I, I didn't actually do that. So, so anyway, uh, this sucker's given me hope <laughs> literally. <laughs> so well, my thing that I'm digging on could kind of help you out. You can come over and try a new recipe, but I'm, I'm digging on the drunken botanist. Um, we have previously talked about Amy Stewart. She's got these delightful like um, books that she just, they're so well-researched and just, she's just such a fun writer. She's got one called Wicked Plants, one called Wicked Bugs, and then she's got the drunken botanist. Um, and I picked it up from the library. I'd, I'd looked through it before, but I wanted to try some new recipes and it really just helps you tr create these amazing drinks from plants that you have in your garden so I'm since I grew more I'm um this year I'm looking through and finding recipes so we'll just have some more cocktails and lament your um sycamore tree so oh, we'll raise a glass to the tree suckers yes <laughs> absolutely so. all right well please come find us on instagram at at geeks in the garden we'll post some pictures of our award winners for sure and um on facebook at geeks in the garden you can find extra content and details on our blog at geeks in the garden .com or search on youtube for our channel geeks in the garden please subscribe on apple podcasts if you haven't already uh leave a review that'd be awesome follow us on spotify or any of the other podcast streamers you can send us comments and questions at geeksgardenpodcast at gmail.com don't forget to tell us your award winners and please join us for our next episode where karen's going to give us um elderberry three ways she's she's gone That's through sweet. And at least three ways. She's taken yeah. the challenge three plus ways. Um, we're also going to talk about something we sort of delved into a little bit in this episode, but wildlife in the garden, both pests and friends um, and how we can garden with our friends in mind. So now go get dirty and have some fun.